So, um, a warm welcome to Michael um, Peritetti. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Grubb. Thank you, Philip, and all the team you've been working with. I also want to honor the ministers, the senior clergymen who are here. I also want to thank all of you, uh, professionals, practitioners, policy people, and also students. You are all welcome. Well, I'm dealing with the role of Pentecostal churches for empowerment in Africa. I understand I have just 40 minutes maximum for my presentation, and uh, there will be questions thereafter. So I'm going to do a mixture of um, the PowerPoint and also I will present from my script. I'll be looking at the introduction, then brief religious demography in Ghana. Um, I think Ghana fairly represents uh, what happens in West Africa. Then strands of Pentecostalism in Ghana, conceptualizing empowerment in Pentecostalism, components and processes of empowerment in Pentecostalism, then ICDC's role in the empowerment agenda. Um, so please, let's... Over the last century, a brand of Christianity aptly described as Pentecostalism has become a significant feature in the global religious landscape. Pentecostalism is now a key religious character in African Christian experience, especially in the last century. This phenomenal spiritual outburst, which started as a wave of revival and renewal, has gone through its full course and now has been established as churches all across the continent, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Pentecostal charismatic spirituality clearly has a strong appeal to millions of Africans. Notwithstanding, the movement has also had its share of criticism based on its distinctive beliefs and practices especially in relation to prosperity gospel and in some cases the abuse of spiritual power. Nonetheless, Pentecostal charismatic Christianity has become a religious force that has implications not only in the spiritual terrain of individuals in society, it transcends the exclusive spiritual realm. It has become it has always been an encountering faith, restoring hope to all who thirst and hunger for spiritual renewal and to accomplish felt and aspirational needs for its followers. Pentecostalism in Africa has great relevance in the religious, social, economic, and political concerns of individuals, congregations, and communities. As such, it is important for critics, admirers, and supplicants to take note of how Pentecostal charismatic churches marshal resources that is human, financial, material for development in their bid to empower all and sundry. For instance, Timothy Longman contemplating the empowering role of the churches in Central Africa observes, quote, because of the economic assets, large membership, international connections, institutional resources, and moral authority, churches are clearly powerful institutions, by which I mean they have substantial influence over the conduct of political, economic, and social life, unquote. Longman's reflection underscores three critical elements noted in embarking on any empowerment program. First, the church's resources, that is human, material, and financial, 
Second, the available social network. And third, the power factor that is accessible to the churches, especially in the African context. The church's empowering role transcends an exclusive religious impact. The late uh, son of Africa, Ubu Kalu, one of the renowned scholars, stated emphatically over a decade ago, and I quote, beyond caricatures, questions abound about its socioeconomic and political significance, gender ideology, and ecumenical temper, precisely because of its aggressive evangelism and non-ideological deliberate endeavor to reshape many religious landscapes. The contemporary growth of the movement appears unstoppable and globally significant." Unquote. The issue Kalu raised sought to emphasize the religious significance of Pentecostalism within the African context and whether Pentecostalism has the gravitas that translates into more authentic and useful establishment within the African society. Another scholar by name David Martin, who passed recently, I think somewhere around March, also recounts, and I quote him, said, all in all, the picture that emerge, emerges of Pentecostalism here is that of voluntary, participatory, enthusiastic and pragmatic faith centered on personal transformation that though playing a pivotal role in helping the marginalized, especially women negotiate poverty, suffering and various challenges of the modern world remains highly ambiguous in its effort. And I know the ambiguity uh, question has already been raised uh, this morning, um, I, I was uh, out of the uh, arena uh, for good reasons. Uh, it wasn't because I wasn't ready to respond to some of the questions my brother knows, Andreas knows that uh, uh, we've spoken about that and I was looking up to it. But uh, somewhere in the middle of the night, I had a call and I had to sit up all night to produce a report for my church back in Ghana. So I worked all night. And uh, by the time I woke up, uh, uh, I had lost gas, and I needed to refuel. So if you did not see me, that's the reason. The viewpoint presented above have stimulated curiosity about Pentecostalism by scholars and practitioners to underscore its empowering role or otherwise. Our focus is largely on Pentecostal charismatic churches in Ghana. As I earlier indicated, um, the, it, you can use that to predict many things, especially in the West African region. Now, um, you can see the gathering of Pentecostal charismatic believers, the anomalies, and uh, I think I have uh, spoken to some of those things. Um, so I would move on. This is a very important <coughs> demography that we need to understand. A brief historical profile of Christianity in Ghana. In the 1960s, Ghana's population, uh, population census report, the traditional indigenous religions, there's a non-Christian uh, extraction religious group, constituted 38.2%. Islam made a score of 12.1%, and Christianity in general, every Catholic, you know, uh, historic mission churches, Pentecostals, indigenous uh, Christians, and all that, they constituted 42.79%. Um, then the government conducted another census, and this happened in the year 2000. And you see what happened. The traditional relig indigenous religions fell from 38.2% to 15.4%. Islam gained marginally to 15.6%. And Christianity, once again, generally had 68.8%. So they seem to be the big winners, as Paul Gifford alluded to. Then again, in 2010, 
you find out that the traditional indigenous religions then came to 5.2%. Islam, again, marginal, increased 176 and Christianity now 71.2%. Now, out of the 71.2%, look at the Christian groups. We have the Roman Catholics, the historic mission churches, and I hope you know what the, who they are. Um, I do not call them main line because I don't think there's any side line. <laughs> I do not call them orthodox because I don't think there is any unorthodox. And I don't call them protestants because I don't know what they are protesting now. <laughs> so I call them, and, and you can quote me you know, on this, I call them historic mission churches. They made up, so the Catholics are 51.1. The historic mission churches under the umbrella of Christian Council of Ghana, they constitute 18.6. Classical Pentecostals and Charismatics, that's new Pentecostals, they made up of 41 and 24.1%. And the African initiated churches, uh, for some reason, they were separated, not by me, by the censors. They made uh, uh, up of 11%. Now, this tells a story. Um, definitely the big witness, as Paul Gifford said, are uh, the classical Pentecostals and the charismatic Christians in Ghana. And so it also brings to question, what are they doing to empower the people if they are in the majority? Now, I have provided this photo. You can see Pastor Otabel here for good reason. Um, recently, the Vatican appointed the Archbishop of Accra. And uh, one of his first taxi call was to go to International Central Gospel Church and uh, visit Pastor Mesa Otabel. You could see in the middle. And um, <coughs> then they had a time of prayer. Now, this tells a story. And this happened just this May, just this May, barely two months ago. And uh, it tells a story of how important uh, the figure Mesa Otabel is in Christianity, especially within West Africa, and if not to say Africa. Now, I want us to conceptualize empowerment. So, um, going to look at the term empowerment has been used in Pentecostalism to depict an intervention, spiritual and natural material, which bring about very tangible and practical effect on people and communities. The notion of power is pivotal in empowerment discourse generally. It must be pointed out that there exist three issues basic to the understanding of empowerment. First, empowerment is multidimensional in that it occurs within sociological, psychological, economic, political, and other dimensions, including the spiritual. Empowerment also occurs at different levels, such as individuals, group, and community. And third, empowerment by definition is a social and spiritual process because it occurs in relation to others. Following this proposition, I seek to conceptualize empowerment within the factors mentioned in the review of Pentecostal Charismatic Christianity. They include the multidimensional purview, different horizon, and the process by which they happen. I'm going to take my eyes off my script so I would save some time and deal with some other issues. So I would run you through the PowerPoint on this level. So we have spoken about this. Now, one of the things you should note about the Pentecostal Charismatic Churches is that they have a self-understanding of what empowerment is. It's contemporaneous to their ministry ethos 
and philosophies. So you see means ultimate spiritual empowerment. You see another giant uh, charismatic preacher, um, Robert, Dr. Robert Ampia Kofi, alluding to a statement that had to do with empowerment. You see wisdom empowerment. Then you also see supernatural empowerment by another um, minister of the charismatic fraternity. See, empowerment night. So it's not a term that is imposed on them. It's a term that is generated by their own activities and ministry philosophies. That is the point I'm making. You see, Supernatural Empowerment Summit 2016. And uh, you see an empowerment service going on and bringing everybody to an understanding of how he or she can you know, lay hands on himself or herself uh, to receive some spiritual virtue, to be able to deal with some very spiritual and tangible uh, issues of our life. Now, this is very interesting because now you see Supernatural Empowerment Conference in Holland organized by Bishop Adinasari of Perez Chapel International. So uh, the whole subject of empowerment that is dealt with by the Pentecostal Charismatic uh, Churches in Africa are now even being exported to uh, their own in the diaspora, which is very, very important to know. Then again, you find supernatural empowerment, and you find people all across Africa. You see Bishop Tudor Bismarck, you see Reverend Sam Kranchankra, you see um, Charles, Bishop Charles Ajinasari, and you see your friend, uh, Apostle Professor Opoku Onyina, he's also part of the empowerment uh, uh, ministry of the Pentecostal Charismatic Churches. Then you can expand it. You see Financial Empowerment Summit. So they talk about spiritual empowerment, but they do not end with spiritual empowerment. Before I even comment on the financial empowerment, I want to make a statement about the spiritual empowerment. Spiritual empowerment is seen as part of the Pentecostal charismatic desire for revival and capacity to engage in spiritual warfare. This is consistent with their soteriological objectives. The Pentecostal charismatic churches Key soteriological goals include the realization of transformation and empowerment, healing and deliverance, and prosperity and success in the lives of believers. So that constitutes the whole understanding of spiritual empowerment. Now when it comes to economic and financial empowerment, the Pentecostal Charismatic Churches also embark on this program for good reasons, to underscore the belief and expectation of prosperity and success in their lives. Pastor Mason Otabel, for instance, has this to say, and I know you would have to listen keenly. I quote him, some people call us charismatic prosperity preachers. I am happy I am not a poverty preacher by the prosperity preacher. And it has connotation for empowerment. Otterbell's assertion connotes a strong self-understanding and realization of many Pentecostal charismatic church leaders and followers on the subject of economic and financial prosperity. For instance, all the major Pentecostal charismatic church leaders in Ghana and Nigeria especially run workshops for their members seeking to educate them with biblical principles of wealth creation. A point to note is that the classical Pentecostals in Ghana and Nigeria could be considered, I mean the classical Pentecostals could be considered moderate in their pursuit of, of economic and financial prosperity. However, the interest in economic and financial empowerment and wealth seeking is not absent in the orientation. The immediate past chairman of the Church of Pentecost, Apostle Prophet, I mean Apostle Professor Opoku Nina cited an elder of the Church of Pentecost, Elder Michael Ajikum Adu, 
as a testimony of the church's drive for prosperity for their members. In recounting his own story, Ado, a successful business entrepreneur and the founder and chief executive officer of the Kama Group No Limited and a member of Ghana Club 100, an association of Ghana Industries, collaborated the ministry impact the Church of Pentecost had made on him. He stated, and I quote him, he said, by the support of the big unknown hand of God, the company has been growing at a very fast rate and prosperity has not left us behind, unquote. In the same vein, the testimony of Kobina Boatin, an academic and a pastor of the Church of Pentecost, narrated how through giving a seed offering to the church out of his loan, got him a scholarship to study abroad in a university in Canada, having benefited from the Canadian scholarship scheme. Thus, seed offerings have become an empowering means by which believers exercise their faith to receive particular blessings. You would see this. This is a very interesting flyer. The man here is the, um, is the current head of the Security and Exchange Commission in Ghana. He's called Reverend Daniel Ubami Tete. He's a professional banker and doubles as the head of Security and Exchange Commission. Then this is a pastor in ICGs by name Reverend Eric Egemeku and another Bishop Gideon Titi Ofer. And they had a conference recently on empowering Christian businesses. This is the point I made earlier, that the subject of empowerment is contemporaneous. It's not something imposed on the churches. It, the churches have a self-understanding of it, and they seek to lead their people to gain financial and economic freedom. Again, you would see this, and that is a very interesting one. So I would quickly move to family empowerment. We've looked at spiritual empowerment, financial and economic empowerment by the churches, then also family empowerment. Another recurring theme in Pentecostal charismatic churches that deserves attention is empowerment. This cause is family empowerment. The churches themselves express this as God's power in the family, or covenant blessings, or covenant family. The basic understanding is that the family is God's idea, a divine institution established by God himself for all who are created in his image and have experienced regeneration through salvation in Jesus Christ. I, because of time, I would want to skip this and because I have a whole lot to deal with. But there are few things that are emphasized in family empowerment, um, they utilize the cell structure, the cell group, which is, um, you know, very similar to how families are put together in the African um, society. And so um, the churches have representation in every community, and they call it cell or covenant family. And it's a small unit of members in the church who identify themselves within a locality. And there are a few things they expect that to be done. Uh, for instance, um, they identify themselves as fake community identity. And it's a catalyst in the growth and development of the church, but also caring for its own. It seeks protection, favor, and well-being for its members. So let me go now. You see a whole church. This is a church's program, but the name of the church is Covenant Family Community Church. Covenant Family Community Church. So the concept of family is ingrained even in the whole agenda of the church. The church is not individualized, it's communal. 
and that is significant for Pentecostalism, especially in Africa. Now, you can see, empowered by the Spirit to fulfill my glorious destiny by Bishop Oyedipo. <coughs> now, another church, it is called Empowerment Worship Center. So it's not that they run programs for empowerment. Now the church also adopt names that are synonymous to the subject of empowerment. So it tells you the mindset and the concept of empowerment and how important it is. All right. Now let's look at empowerment horizon in Pentecostal Christianity in Africa. The individual or personal empowerment. You have the look at personal transformation. So any agenda for personal empowerment had to do with personal transformation, self-determination, and search for identity. These three are very, very important. Then, when it comes to collective and group empowerment, it has to do with the critical awareness of the group. It has to do with the alternative visions and values, and it has to do with the mobilization of resources. So we can safely say that the notion such as collective belonging and involvement and controls are key characteristics of collective empowerment. These concepts are features of the Pentecostal charismatic churches in their ethos and functions. The two levels, individual and community groups, have their destinies interdependent and mutually reinforcing. Now, this is really the point I want to emphasize on this presentation, components and processes of empowerment. There are few statements that I would um, bring to your attention so you can follow the thoughts. The major work of the Pentecostal Charismatic Churches is to direct people to God's saving power through Jesus Christ. In pursuing this objective, the churches have also demonstrated that in order to satisfy the felt and aspirational needs of their own members and to fulfill its missions, other issues sensitive to the needs of their own must be engaged. Components and processes of empowerment include the notions of power and powerlessness, rhetoric, awareness and control, human development programs, are all elements considered in the processes of empowerment. So I'm going to start with the subject of power and powerlessness. Power and powerlessness are major topics for consideration. The notion of power is central to both empowerment discourse and Pentecostalism. Discussions around empowerment take cognizance of the power dynamics. Empowerment can begin to be understood by examining the concept of power and powerlessness. The term power may be applied in different fields of studies with precise definitions within the context of each study. It may also be examined from different theorists from diverse backgrounds, perhaps from Max Weber to Michel Facult. Power may also be studied from diverse concepts, contexts, and disciplines. For instance, you can study power from the area of political power, financial power, economic power, cultural power, gender power, religious power, and what have you. However, a general consideration of the term power may be understood as the capacity of some persons and organizations to produce intended foreseen and unforeseen effects on others. The capacity in this context is people, social and human capital, and resources 
could be spiritual, cultural, material capital. This shows the benefit that accrues to religious groups, especially in Pentecostalism. Powerlessness, on the other hand, may be regarded as the hope of an individual or a people who consider their actions to have a consequence in affecting the outcomes of their life occurrences. And you know we can talk about two forms of powerlessness. We can talk about surplus powerlessness, and we can also talk about um, real powerlessness. Uh, I think I want to skip that. So um, basically, the two concepts, power and powerlessness, is useful in predicting religious phenomenon whose conception of power is key to its beliefs and practices, like Pentecostalism. Both concept, power and powerlessness, from the very ideological basis of Pentecostalism, in, in form the very ideological basis from you know, Pentecostalism in Africa. The expression of power is you know, counteracting negative forces and using power to negotiate social, spiritual, political, and economic interests are key to those churches. So when they talk about power, they do not talk about power in exclusion from the key subjects of society. When they talk about power, they mean spiritual power. So all the inimical forces that are after you, to destroy you, they stand ready to deal with those powers. When they talk about financial power, that is why they would set up subjects like uh, financial education in the churches. When they talk about you know, social power, they speak about the concept of the family and all that. So it's ingrained, it's intertwined, and it has cross-cutting effects in the churches. This assumption is especially true in the African context in which Pentecostal-like worship and practices are widespread. The churches are conscious of this power dynamics, especially as it is manifest in their beliefs and practices. They do not consider spiritual power exclusive, sorry, conclusive in itself. It affects religious and supernatural outcomes. However, it is also deemed to affect all departments of life, from economic to health, public life issues to social behavior and politics. This power construct has been associated with Pentecostalism. And normally, they make reference to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which says that, um, you know, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so they are very, very conscious of uh, power that is received. Let me just, um, and I think this, this is not, this is not um, strange for you can also find um, the concept of power, for instance, in Amandla, in the Zulu language, which signifies, uh, signifies the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit over all type of oppressions. You know, it evokes the power and the extra power and grace through which the Holy Spirit diagnoses, heals, and revitalizes believers. Now, it's not only power, you also have declarations. So when you talk about power, this is power. Mm -hmm. Healing, this is power. Pentecostalism has become a dynamic equivalent to previously you know, uh, religious and cultural practices and experiences. This is power. <laughs> so personal and individual empowerment relate to the way people think of themselves as well as knowledge, capacity, skills, and mastery they actually possess. You know, as someone did who says the same, it's very important you can take note of that. And then I would speak briefly about, uh, uh, about uh, declarations. You know, Mrs. Otaba said, just being alive is not an achievement, and that is rhetoric. We must anticipate old age and plan for it. Now, they are very, very mindful about what they say. Um, for instance, um, uh, <laughs> I wish I had time to deal with this. 
you know, they employ religious rhetoric to show how people should receive, you know, inner strength and be able to live their lives. So, for instance, Pentecostal charismatic churches and their pastors, you know, are very precise. They employ religious terms and phrases such as, uh, to cite some example, you are under open heavens. When they declare to you you are under open heavens, it means a lot. And they said, you are blessed beyond measure. You are blessed and highly favored. You are unshakable. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. You know, the eyes of the Lord is upon you. You are above and not beneath. Be still and see the salvation of the Lord. No condemnation. You are blessed to be a blessing. God is good all the time. Satan is bad all the time. God has an amazing plan for you. Prayer is the key. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Such declarations are stirred up in the spirit and filtered through the souls of members. And so they are things that they encourage people to say repeatedly and eventually it, it gets into them and it gives them the well withal to be able to lead their lives. Then we have empowerment as awareness and control. An empowerment discourse conveys notions of awareness and control. This reflects Robin Houghton arguments on the subject of communion on one side and explanation, prediction, and control. When you look at any religious expression in Africa, it possesses this you know, uh, qualities. The qualities of explanation, whether it's Pentecostalism, it's uh, traditional religions, and what have you. It has prediction and it has control. And those are notions of empowerment. Um, then again, empowerment as uh, self-development, and uh, we can see, now this that you can see is a changing form of liturgy in many Pentecostal charismatic Christianity. You would think this is a typical orchestra, you know, that should be in Germany or in some other Western state playing all the instruments that come, you know, the full complement of musical instruments. But this is typically in Ghana by a Pentecostal charismatic church. So, components and processes of empowerment in Pentecostal charismatic Christianity is negotiating power and powerlessness, declaration as empowerment, rhetoric, awareness and control, and self and personal development. These are the pointers in, in which the churches run in their various expressions. So, power may be understood, you know, in different ways by them, but the notion is very clear. Now, this statement is so important. It was made by a great scholar by name Harvey Cox. Cox. He is an ardent critic of Pentecostals and Charismatics. But this is what he says. He says, they provide their followers with the weapons of the spirit they need to fight back against the forces of evil as they manifest themselves in disease and discord. And I think it's so key, especially as we think of those churches and sometimes we think they are, you know, uh, operating in the peripheral. You know, they are really in the center of life and the life of the African. Now, when it comes to politics, I remember, you know, leading to the political season, um, somebody like T.B. Uh, Joshua was in the center of Ghanaian politics. Everybody wants to know who is going to win. And they will not look for the political pundits. They will look for somebody like T.B. Joshua to speak to the issues. Well, my time is up. Um, I actually would not find time to present to you ICGC. Um, I will just mention some few things. Recently, this is what ICGC did. It donated, you know, like electroconvulsive therapy machines to psychiatric hospitals in Ghana. You know, the, all the psychiatric hospitals in Ghana, did, it was only one that had this machine. And none of them. And so the church had to be able to raise money and do it. And this is the time of the donation. It happened just last month. It's also very conscious of health needs. Just by believing in divine healing and also practicing good health. 
Uh, so you see this Pastor Otabel, this Pastor Otabel leading the whole church, you know, in a health walk. You also see this just an assembly. It's not a whole church, just a branch of uh, one of the churches, you know, ministering to 5,400 children consistently intervening in the affairs. And that's some of the practical effect of the churches. Then central aid is actually the, uh, the, uh, the church's uh, you know, uh, vehicle in ministering social needs. And they do many things. Uh, they provide scholarship. Now, many people may not know, but I see GC as a church is next, you know, uh, the biggest provider of scholarship next to the government scholarship scheme. And they've done that this over ages. So um, basically, that is uh, what I have to say when it comes to uh, the church, uh, especially Pinkosa Charismatic Churches, and uh, empowerment in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for your powerful presentation. Uh, now we have time for discussion. Yes. Um. Yeah, thank you for your really powerful and energetic uh, presentation. So I'm a teacher. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so I hope not to preach now, but uh, I have some, some questions that the pictures you were showing were really powerful and, and energetic and the promises are really enormous, I must say. And so when I got it right through empowerment and a righteous uh, lifestyle and with prayer, um, I can succeed in with those things like economically, culturally, spiritually, I can succeed. My question is, um, one of the, the promises was you or you are only empowered to become what you believe what is when I fail when I have no success is it my fault did I didn't I pray right or long enough uh, what happens with those who are failing I know what is possible with the power of belief believe me I'm triathlete I know what's possible beyond anything but Failure is human as well, but what happens when I fail and what happens with those who are failing the best, they tried the best, but they're failing within the community or in the church? Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is also almost similar. I just wanted to understand uh, how do you deal with the spiritual abuse of power? Secondly, it will be, you said, you mentioned something about liturgy, the change of liturgy. Do you have any formal or a way of you, you, the way you are running your liturgy in a formal sense so that you will be able to say, now we're changing the liturgy into something else that was shown there. Thank you. Uh, it's fine. Uh, Mr. Mother King has asked my question. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Terry, thank you very much for for powerful message. But uh, I have two questions. I looked at your pictures carefully. I see you have uh, male bishops or uh, people who are empowering people. You don't have uh, females. What is the problem? Are they not empowered? <laughs> Uh, my, my second question is, you know, Africa. Africa is a continent uh, of people who, are, uh, who, are, who have been victims to many forces. Exploitation, and you call them colonization, you call them. If they are approached with this kind of approach you, you have, they are vulnerable. They are likely to surrender and you call that a powerful. I'm, a, I'm asking whether you have ever considered that these people who are coming big numbers to your stadium and so on, it's because they don't have alternative. 
and they are just surrendering to your powerful message. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Um, it resonates strongly with some of the uh, things that I was finding in, in, in some of the research that I do. But I was very much interested in your reflection with the changing forms of power and authority. I think you rightly highlighted that when the Canadian election was ongoing, people would not go to uh, political scientists and academics um, um, in, in, in trying to explain who was more likely to, to win. Uh, in some of the young people that I, uh, I, I focused on my research, they would tell me that even if they have a final exam tomorrow, they would rather go for an all-night prayer and then come tomorrow morning. So the, the pastor has become the center um, uh, 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 of authority and power. Um, that sort of supplants the traditional, uh, uh, I mean, sources of power. So I just wanted your reflection with regards to this changing forms of power and authority. What could explain this, in, especially in, in, in relation to what you've highlighted? Thank you. The last statement of progress and then Thank you. Um, I thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for the, uh, the good report and the good organization. My only question is um, in the pictures that we have seen, someone was being given water. And I was. How do you know it's water? It could be anointing oil. <laughs> oh, okay. Something from the grass. Okay. So I was, uh, I was asking myself, is that, a, is this medicine? Is this water which has uh, been uh, to heal him? He, uh, if he is sick, we didn't go to hospital, or that would be the healing process from the, from that point. All right, thank you. Can I now respond? Okay, good. Well, uh, the first had to do with beliefs um, uh, and what, how it handles failure. That when people are made to believe that they would succeed and eventually they do not succeed. Interestingly, um, one of the things that everybody who studies or is interested in Pentecostalism must understand is that um, it's what we call um, it's a pneumatological. Let me break it down. It, it has it has it focuses on the spiritual life. So it emphasizes on spiritual context, and I'm going to explain this. Then. It utilizes local context. And that is why it's growing very fast, especially, you know, uh, because it's able to adjust and uh, receive and absorb, you know, the local situation in various places. It's not a codified religion where it's transported from one place to the other and make it work, no. So the people already have what I call a religious mindset. The recipient. So all that they are doing, they are moving. You know, they are they are allowing a different driver to drive the vehicle they have always been in. They used to go to other places, traditional uh, uh, settings. You know, for prediction, for uh, you know, they want to know about their destinies. They want to know what uh, fatalism, what becomes of them, and all that. They will go and perform rituals in the shrine and all those places. Now, Pentecostalism has become a dynamic equivalent by which they wouldn't need to go to those places, but they can go to God by the form that has been provided to them and still get what they think they will know. Now, when they fail, they do not consider that as a failure. They always have a way, you know, I'm speaking like an outsider. I'm both an outsider and an insider. You know, they always have a way to say that, look, if you fall seven times, you're going to rise seven times. And I'm sure some of you have heard it before. 
that in itself is empowering. That is why they will not be committing suicide, even in failure. Because they have an alternative. You may say that is, you know, um, numbing their, themselves from reality. But no, it has a way of generating strength from within for them to face the hardships of life. So that is what I will say to it. Then the spiritual abuse and power, definitely it's present. Um, because we have different forms. Even within the charismatic or the neo-pentecostal strand alone, you have substrands, you know, and you have all kinds of the, the prophetic, you know, and uh, the imbibe all kinds of um, practices and beliefs, uh, you know, and, and they run by it. So um, that is there. There is abuse of power in terms of structural power, and there is abuse of power in terms of practice, you know. Um, well, uh, I think it's present in every religious uh, setup. Uh, it may be very prominent because Pentecostals and Charismatics are allowed. But it's present. And uh, they try maybe what we should focus on and how to bring attention to that so they will cut down on that and be able, and you know, for most of the Pentecostal um, followers, I would say the leaders, it's until recently, you know, it's based on experience. Pentecostalism is based on religious or spiritual experience. So you don't need to have a theological degree to become a bishop. You don't need to have, you just need to receive grace from God and a calling from God and you are there to minister. So sometimes they themselves may not even know that they become, you know, uh, instruments of abuse. The third, okay, there was another one, change in liturgy. One of the things you should, one of the marks of Pentecostalism, it's its fluidity. It's so fluid, sometimes it changes and they themselves do not know later to, be real, to realize that uh, they have moved from their old practices. You know, and it's always evolving. And it's so with every pneumatic movement. When I say pneumatic movement, movements that emphasize spiritual life. You know, it's always because the vision must come from the spirit, so as and when the spirit directs and guides. So new visions, new churches, new visions, new programs, new visions, new agendas. That's how it is. Then, uh, I think, is it financial empowerment? Oh, I, I think approaches to empowerment. Um, no alternative and uh, this era, uh, that which is being given to them. Now, when, when you put it that way, I mean, an outsider can easily put it that way, that they don't have alternatives in order. Go and check it out. You have professors in the universities going to these people. You have knowledgeable, knowledgeable people, members of parliament, people who are very prosperous in their own uh, settings, who are members of these churches. So would you say that they have no alternative? I know that that agenda has been pushed, but they have far moved away from that. I know um, scholars like Gifford had spoken to that, that because people do not have alternatives, so they settle for whatever that is being given to them. Um, I know uh, other scholars who have become very critical. It's not a matter of alternative livelihood. It's a matter of belief and what gives them the well without to live the life that they want to. Just like when people want to talk about development, and to, uh, on Saturday I'm going to deal with the subject of development. And I asked myself for all the 17 pointers of the SDGs, which one really from the African perspective speaks to the subject of development? Because when an African talks about development, he's talking about moral standing. He's talking about how you can navigate through spiritual maze and complexities to be able to stand the inimical powers that exist, which are very real to him. So how then do you measure that as well? So it's not an alternative. It's a real life that they live and pursue. Then he said there are no photos of... Um, 
female leaders uh, probably I should have I know there are few around I know Christy Dutete who is a bishop in International Central Gospel Church we have supervising ministers who are female uh, I was, uh, one of our supervising ministers in the western region Takoradi, secondly Takoradi is called Patience Adai, Reverend Patience Adai he supervises hundreds of uh, male pastors you know, so there are uh, female pastors, and they do not play subordinate role. They play roles just like any other male pastor plays. Then, um, power becoming or change of power and uh, authority. Is that the question? Yeah. Change of power and authority. Yeah, yeah it was. It was just. It, it was just a. Uh, um, I wanted your reflection with regards to. I mean, something. Oh, okay. I mean, the shift of. The power, shift of power. From, um, I mean, the traditional sources of power, like an mm -hmm. academic Afrobarometer. Why would, uh, for instance, uh, people go to TV Joshua and not maybe follow Afrobarometer? And I was saying, in some of the research that I was doing, students would also tell me that. If they would rather go for an all-night prayer than uh, to go and study in the library, even if they have a, 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 a final exam tomorrow. So, so I was just interested in what, what's your thinking I'm, about uh, it. I'm clear about it now. Now, you understand it here. You understand what's happening here. So ask yourself, <coughs> how come that the traditional religious you know, uh, people are losing clients? And definitely they are not losing them in their numbers to Islam. Actually, I think that had it not been for the uh, classical Pentecostals and Charismatics and the African-initiated churches, Islam would have had a field day in West Africa. They have become the bulwark against you know, uh, their, their growth and their, their spread because Pentecostals and Charismatics, they offer effective alternatives to people who would have otherwise gone to the other way around, I mean other places, especially when they lose hope in the historic mission churches and the Catholic churches. So that becomes a very major intervention. And you see the growth within a short time, they move from you know, uh, their majority, and they became the very minority, 5.2%. It tells you what is happening within a space of how many years? 40 years. So the shift of power tells you it's become a very, you know, viable alternative. And that's what I said. You know, the African, no matter how sophisticated he or she becomes, Plant him anywhere in the Western you know, environment, in the Asian environment and all that, would always be conscious of reality in the spirit. And that is what Pentecostalism guarantees.